Good morning. Welcome to St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. My name is Jeff Smith and I have the privilege of serving as pastor here. We welcome you here this morning in the name of Christ. Don't forget to check in whether you're here in person or watching us live stream. You can check in on the app or on the comment sections of YouTube or Facebook. And if you need help knowing how to do that, you can contact James Roberts at our church. Also, there are worship signups if you want to attend worship in person, and we're uh, signing up not only for the week ahead, but all the way through Christmas Eve services. So if you would like to sign up, please go to our homepage, and you can find uh, from there how to, how to get to the place where you sign up for those services. And for those of you that are here with us in person, we are really glad that you're here. Welcome. Just a couple of things. The offering is not passed because of COVID restrictions, but there is a box out in the entryway if you would like to give, but you can also give through our app online really easily and uh, set up a one-time or recurring gift that way. So you can do that as well. At the end of the service, um, the ushers will come and, and release you row by row just to keep us socially distanced. And as you exit, you can, of course, stay in the, in the sanctuary in a corner and talk, just try not to block the aisles. But then if you want and you exit, exit all the way outside under the cover. I know we have the walkways, it's raining, but and visit outside if you would, just to keep everyone else uh, socially distanced as they leave as well. This year, as we've said, we did not have an in-person Navidad market, but we have a virtual one, a wonderful webpage that even if uh, you've never really known the missions of our church, this is a phenomenal way to get to know a lot of the missions that we support. And uh, we would love for you to go and choose some missions to support as gift giving this year, where you give that gift in honor of someone and support certain missions. It's a great way, I said last week, I think, that we do this with our children. Uh, we, we set aside a certain amount of money that's one of their gifts, and they get on the virtual webpage, and they choose missions to support as part of their Christmas as well. So please take time uh, to go and visit the site and support those missions. You know this year of all years, they need our support. Also, end of year giving is coming up and in the weekly email each week, there was also a, a very detailed email that I sent out a week or so ago uh, with details about that. We would love for you to uh, find ways, the best ways for you to give as the year ends. So please take time to look at that. And then as part of our Advent Christmas season, we're doing both a Secret Santa and a Holiday Trivia Night. And there's information in our weekly email and on our webpage about that as well. Well, during Advent, for our gratitude times, our time to be grateful to God, we're celebrating the Advent candle. And today, uh, Jan Kelly and family are coming up to do that. Let's welcome them. Good morning. Uh, my mother is here in spirit because she's at home recovering from pneumonia and Caroline, who is studying, said, uh, Nanny, you're not going out in the rain. So pretend she's standing here. She'd actually be reading if she hadn't gotten pneumonia. Not COVID, it was just pneumonia. And Patrick is my nephew, so we're so grateful to be here. <clears throat> Last Sunday, we lit the candles of hope and of love. 
We light them, remembering that Christ, who was born in Bethlehem, came to show us God's unending love and forgiveness so that we may show God's love to others. A third candle of Advent is the candle of joy. It's pink for joy. When the angel Gabriel told Mary that Jesus was to be born to her, she began to sing, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Just as the birth of Jesus gave great joy to his mother, so God's presence in us <clears throat> gives us great joy. Jesus' healing and hope and love is for all people. We light the candle of joy to remind us that Jesus is born in us. We have joy, and through him will be everlasting joy on earth. With the candle we celebrate, the joy we find in Jesus Christ. And let us pray. Thank you, God, for the joy you give us. Let us experience the presence of your spirit with us as we wait for your promises to come true and for Christ to come again. Help us today and every day to share your joy with others. We ask this in the name of the one who was born in Bethlehem. Amen. Please stand. This is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Shall come to thee, O Israel.
Our reading today comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer great grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let us pray. God of all, God of all believers, exiles, and missionaries scattered around the world, we come to you today united in praising you. We glorify and honor you, Father, for your faithfulness. Time and time again, amidst all the personal trials and communal tribulations, like the second wave of the pandemic that we face, you keep on reminding us and showing us that you are the one true God, the source of all our joy. And yet, Lord, in spite of the joy you pour upon us, we still find ourselves in a winding, difficult path of our own making. We bend to the negative influences of our culture. We consider ourselves higher than our neighbors. We call those who utilize science as faithless and call those who genuinely ask questions as morons. We chose to live a fearful and joyless life. God who saved us and still saving us, we come running back to you and confess our many sins. God of joy and exaltation, strengthen us who are weak. God of the universe, we pray to you for our broken world. We pray for our environment. We pray for the students taken away by gunmen in Nigeria. We pray for the exploited migrants in Spain and everywhere else. We pray for those oppressed in Hong Kong and many other places. We pray for those who are physically sick and mentally troubled. We pray for those who tend to the sick, and we pray for our leaders. Thank you, Father, for steering our hearts on this third Sunday of Advent. We are once again eager for the coming of Christ. We rejoice for our Lord who comes with authority and power, masked in the humble form of a child. We look forward with joy and anticipation to eventually claim our inheritance of salvation through him. We pray all this in the name of Christ, our inexpressible joy, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. 
Amen. Please stand. Lord, we adore you this season. Thank you for your love and your light. Come, let us adore you. It is by grace that we are saved.
Please be seated. Would you pray with me? Lord, teach us what it means to adore you. I think our, um, our pride gets in the way. And yet, Lord, um, in my life, I've learned through experience that worship is one of the things I'm made to do. I will worship something. If I don't worship you, I will worship something else. But I have to worship, and so may we worship you today, God. And may we have hope today as we worship, even in one of the darkest years of our life, Lord. May we not lose hope. And to that end, Lord, I pray that you would pour upon me the gift of preaching, that my very frail and broken and human words might, by the power of your Holy Spirit, become your living word, uniquely crafted for each and every one of our hearts. We pray it with confidence, because we pray it in the name of the one born in Bethlehem. Amen. Well, we're in our third week of our Advent series, The Gift of Christmas, and of course that gift 
is Jesus, whom God sent into the world. And last week we talked about that Advent is there to teach us the gift of patience. And this week we're talking about a gift just as crucial, the gift of hope. Hope is a fundamental element of Advent. Anne Lamott puts it this way. She says, Advent is a time of preparation and waiting because even though as autumn grinds to a dark and murky halt, everything is dying and falling asleep and falling off, something brand new is coming. Hope is coming. And so one of the messages of Advent is don't weep over leaves. For Advent, the seasonal change of autumn into winter symbolizes spiritual death and darkness that we need to be saved from. And this year, if we add the pandemic and apocryphal weather events in 2020, not to mention political turmoil and a precarious economy, I feel like our world is exposing more than ever the reality of our desperate need for the warmth of spring to bring life to this cold and dead winter in which we find ourselves, for the light of Jesus to come and shine in our darkness. Each year, that is the promise of Advent. The question is, for this year, how do we find the faith to hope in that promise? Today's passage from Peter that we heard Alex read gives us important context when it states the challenging times are nothing new. He writes, In all this you greatly rejoice, though for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. The Christians of this day that Peter, to whom Peter was writing were under a constant threat of persecution, not the kind of persecution we might imagine for Christians today, or at least for most American Christians, where we feel put down or mocked or some right is being taken away, but life-threatening persecution instituted by a foreign power. But the tough times even preceded that. Even the first advent, as the world unknowingly prepared for Jesus to come, the world was in turmoil with Israel under the volatile control of Rome. And then if we choose to, we can keep going back to Israel and Judah being sacked and taken captive by other foreign powers. And then even further back to the Hebrews being enslaved in Egypt for hundreds of years. What comes to me as I ponder the history is Peter has confidence to proclaim hope in spite of these life-threatening fears. Because God's people being under threat of life and limb is nothing new. And Peter knows God has delivered them again and again. Peter is looking back to find strength and faith to look forward. Peter is looking back to find strength and faith to look forward. And that's what we're doing today, isn't it? We're looking back at scriptures that were written many, many, many centuries ago to find hope in the midst of a year that we may feel hopeless. And that's good. But even more, what Peter talks about is, is there as well. God's promise of all promises, right? Jesus has now come, Emmanuel, God with us. And Peter is assured that this whole history of suffering of God's people, including their own at that time, is cast in a different light because of that. For Messiah, the promised deliverer, the one who will save us, has come. Jesus is now the very source and power in Peter's hope. So what does it mean for us to wait while seasonally and societally the world grows dark around us? What does it mean to hope in this way? Are we just to decide to be optimistic as we look ahead, is hope the same as optimism? As practical as it might seem to answer yes to that question, there's strong evidence to the contrary. In my research about hope, I came across an article entitled Theologies of Hope, written by Miroslav Volf, who's one of today's great living theologians. The thoughts I share about optimism and hope are based on that article. What is optimism? And how does it differ from hope? Well, Wolf states that optimism, if it is justified, 
is based on extrapolations we make about the future based upon what we can reasonably discern to be the tendencies in the present, right? We look around us, we see certain things that we can predict and we push it out. Think about weather forecasters, right? In Houston, they have been predicting beautiful weather recently until the last few days. It's been amazing though, hasn't it? The weather was incredible. Such forecasts and predictions give us reason to be optimistic about future weather based upon current patterns that they observe heading our way. It is right to feel optimistic based on this criteria. Wolf then says this about hope. Hope is different. Hope is not based on accurate extrapolation about the future from the character of the present. The hoped for future is not born out of the present. The future good that is the object of the hope is a new thing, novum, that comes in part from outside the situation. Make sense? Hope differs from optimism because of its source. God is not asking you and me this Advent to be optimistic about our world's future based upon the evidence we see around us in 2020. That's not the basis of Advent. No, God is asking us to be hopeful. The future we are counting on and hoping for and longing for is a new thing that comes from outside of our situation. Wolf again. The way we generally use the word hope can be roughly defined as the expectation of good things that don't come to us as a matter of course. In hope, a future good which isn't yet, somehow already is. A future good we cannot see, which waits in darkness, still qualifies our entire existence. As I read that, and as I'm reminded of what hope is, hope begins to well up in my heart. This, this is what my heart longs for in 2020. The promise of a future good which isn't yet, somehow already is. A future good we cannot see which waits in the darkness of 2020 still qualifies our entire existence. That is what God is promising in Advent. And in today's reading, we see that Peter also has found hope in the promise of this new thing that God is doing that has nothing to do with their current circumstances way back in the first century. He writes, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This isn't a future based on whatever we can extrapolate from our current circumstances, whatever good we can grab hold of. In the year 2020. No, this promised inheritance is much more solid and dependable than any future we can fathom based upon today's world. Wolf, one more time. When every course of action by which we could reach the desired future seems destined to failure, when we cannot reasonably draw a line that would connect the terror of the present with future joy, hope, with future joy. Hope remains indomitable and indestructible. When we hope, we always hope against reasonable expectations. More than ever, in 2020, we need to rediscover hope. Because when it comes to ultimate things, optimism is and always has been woefully inadequate. And at this point, if your thinking is similar to mine, you may be asking, but why, Jeff? Why is God allowing a year like 2020 to test us so? I found the answer to that question as Peter continues. He says, in all of this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Like a muscle, our faith must be engaged regularly to remain effective. God knows we must engage our faith to embrace hearty hope. 
And like any good parent, God allows, doesn't cause necessarily, but allows a certain amount of suffering in order for growth to be assured. Think about any parent, right? Whether that's the risk of a falling, of falling that a child must endure to learn to walk, or the heartbreak a son or daughter must encounter if they are to ever experience true love, as difficult as it is for both parent and child, a good parent allows the suffering required to produce the growth necessary. This is what Peter is saying God is doing. Though we suffer grief in all these trials, these trials have come so that your faith is proven genuine. In other words, a refining of faith is required if a person is to be able to engage the living hope of Jesus Christ during the darkened days of Advent. For like it or not, wait, we must. For this future is not yet here, the promised one. But even in the dark, there are signs, there are reminders to encourage our faith. Anne Lamott again says, we find it where we can and exactly as it comes to us while the days grow dark. We remind ourselves that you can only see the stars when it is dark and the darker it is, the brighter the light breaking through. So maybe the hyper-darkness of 2020 isn't all bad. Maybe 2020's darkness is accentuating, more than ever, our need for and our ability to see the light of the world shining through. And so may we fully embrace the suffering required to refine our faith in Advent 2020. For each of us needs a faith that can see the stars shining bright in the midst of this Advent darkness. A faith that fully rests upon our God, who has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Would you pray with me? God, we give you this our world in 2020, we're overwhelmed by the darkness and the despair and the brokenness, the divisions, the hurt, the hate, the harm. And yet, Lord, we want to lay this darkness down and we want to allow it to make us perceive the light shining all the brighter. And so, Lord, this Advent, may you give us the gift of hope. And may we find hope Grounded not in what we extrapolate from what we see around us, but only in the light and the life of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Lo, how a rose there blooming. Please stand with me. It's supposed to be a piece before. Oh, sorry. You may be seated. You may be seated.
I give the benediction just a reminder to wait for the ushers to uh, exit you and also can we give God thanks for the worship today amen thank you I don't know about you but as I got studying hope and I was trying to figure out something new to say about hope this whole idea about hope versus uh, optimism really got me I think I was really trying to conjure up optimism this advent and it was not working. Um, so I hope for you, my hope for you is that you find hope in this Advent season, that you do not try to rely on what you see around you to determine a hopeful future, but you look to the scriptures and to the gospel and good news of Jesus Christ. For when we do, God is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or even imagine according to his power that is at work within us. And so to him and him alone be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus our Lord from this day forward, now and evermore, may it be so.